Okay, we're back talking more about trials, the Elizabeth Holmes defense. I feel like an on-air court reporter, but I'm not. I am Justin with Prison Professors and White Collar Advice. And if you're here, thank you for watching this video. If you're listening on our Prison Professor podcast, you're awesome. Thank you for joining us. And uh, yes, if you're watching this video after the last one, I'm wearing the same shirt as I'm filming them back to back as part of this series. Now that I've wasted seven seconds of your life, let's transition to some of the defenses that Elizabeth Holmes is going to use in this case. Some people would argue she's grasping or reaching for straws, but you got to do the best with what you got. Whether you're that interested in this case or not, this will be helpful for you to learn about the way that a defendant would work with a lawyer to prepare for trial, to see if the arguments they make influence a jury in the end, and for you to learn more about this very cynical system. So with, without wasting more of your time, I don't think I'm wasting your time. Maybe. We'll know. Uh, we're going to go to this blog produced at prisonprofessors.com. Again, at prisonprofessors.com, there's a panoply of free resources for you, from books to blogs to videos, information for you to digest, to absorb, and to really get better educated about this warped world that is the criminal justice system. So invest the time to, to learn. So if you're listening uh, to our podcast and you don't have access to the blog as I go through it, uh, simply go to prisonprofessors.com. It's right there for you. Three defenses Holmes is going to employ, and I'll offer some of my on-court assessment as we go through them, includes she's going to state that she suffered post-traumatic stress disorder and other issues as a result of her co-defendant, Sonny Balwani, who, as I mentioned in the previous video, she hired in 2009. They were lovers. She's going to throw him under the bus to use some prison parlance here and put as much of the blame on him as possible. You can accept expect Balwani at his trial, either to equally blame her or just flat out deny the claims. In my experience, uh, I don't foresee this to be that successful because she was the CEO. She was the leader and evidence that's pretty accessible from her statements and presentations makes clear she was a believer of this product. And the leader, and in my opinion, like the accolades that came with being a young executive of a company that was raising hundreds of millions of dollars, but we'll see. That's the reason uh, she's going to, to trial. Perhaps her jury, the jury will be sympathetic to her. Uh, the second and third defenses are I, I would probably be more plausible because it's not unrealistic to think that someone working in Silicon Valley would make a misrepresentation or say something wrong to raise capital. And, and that's an argument the government's going to make, which was in any of these startups in Silicon Valley, aggressive marketing, perhaps some puffing, is required to raise money. Now, there's a big difference, of course, between puffing and misrepresentation. That actually goes back to a psychology course I took at USC so long ago, a whole breakdown of marketing. Uh, it was a psychology and marketing course. Anyway, manipulation or misrepresentation is different than, than puffing. And her lawyers are gonna try to argue that this is just standard practice in Silicon Valley. In the last defense, they are going to try to persuade the jury to acquit is missing data unavailable for trial will corroborate Holmes's story. So we will see again to learn more about the basics of a trial. I encourage you to go to prison professors, read the first blog, the video we just posted where I'm wearing the same yellow Travis Matthew shirt. Don't judge me. But I encourage you to go to begin to make your own assessment. Pretend that you're in that jury box. Think about how you would be influenced by these arguments as you follow along in these series. Now, we don't we don't want to diminish the impact that PTSD could have on, on someone. In fact, clients of ours who have pled guilty have successfully mitigated their sentence. When I say mitigate, it doesn't mean they didn't go to prison, but it was a good part of their mitigated package of why they got a shorter sentence. For example, a client of ours served two tours in Iraq and lost his best friend while there and came home and fell victims uh, to some drug use and sold some handguns he had acquired illegally. Um, and it was just a very bad time. And he went to prison for a little while, but he honestly and very authentically articulated how this PTSD just took him down this hole for a very long time. It was a very dark time in his life. Again, didn't excuse his behavior. People misconstrue mitigation as excusing. It's not. It's simply a part of the story. So whether she's convicted if she's convicted, an eventual mitigation factor in that conviction will be this PTSD they claim she received as a result of, of this executives or of Balwani, 
uh, that she had PTSD, depression, and other anxiety as a result of, of working with her. For example, she claims that Balwani verbally disparaged her, went through and withdrew affection if she displeased him, controlled what she ate, how she dressed, and how much money she could spend, who she can interact with, essentially dominating her and erasing her capacity to make decisions. Now, the government would argue, you started this company and began raising money in 03. You didn't hire him until 09. You know, which, which is it? Balwani, they say, engaged in abusive conduct, monitoring her calls, text messages and emails, violence, throwing objects at her, restricting her sleep, monitoring her movements. Good Lord, that sounds like federal prison, monitoring movements and restricting sleep. Sounds like Holmes was married to someone, could have been a prison guard, no joke. That's kind of what it's like in prison, especially in a higher security prison, the restriction of movements. Further, they allege that he insisted that any success she had was because of him. That's actually very frustrating. If true, there's nothing worse than someone in life taking credit for your hard work. And if that's something that he did um, while wrong, doesn't necessarily mean that it's a crime. He's going to trial. We're going to see the argument that he that, that he makes to a degree. Maybe he said, she said, at the end of the day, I think it's going to come down to the second and third issue, the aggressive marketing and how much did she know in these trials? And does it cooperate or not cooperate with her story? Her lawyers are going to argue that, um, Holmes could not form the fraudulent intent needed to prove her guilt while suffering from abuse and trauma at the hands of her co-defendant. Legal observers call this the Svengali defense. Svengali refers to an evil person who dominates, manipulates, and controls another. In criminal law, this defense portrays the criminal defendant as, the, as a pawn in the hands of a more influential and persuasive criminal mastermind. Holmes will try to convince the jury that Balwani, who will not be present during Holmes's trial, was the Svengali. This is a very important dynamic. I remember hearing about this, I think, in prison. I'm really happy that our colleague wrote about it in this blog because it is going to speak to the aggressive approach her team is going to make. And we're going to say how believable it is, replete with text messages and emails. If she had PTSD, was she going to therapy repeatedly and disclosing it to a counselor? Can she back up her claims of, of emotional and physical distress? Uh, time will tell. Now, as I just mentioned, you can expect or we'll see how thoroughly her lawyers can substantiate this PTSD because they will absolutely call uh, counselors and psychologists and experts to the stand who will far, part, focus on partner violence. Now, what's interesting here is you can expect the government to claim, well, this is a biased witness. Even though this person may be a professional, they're paid. They're a paid expert of the defense to, to say these things. So you can expect the version the counselor portrays is going to fit the defendant's version of events. That's what they're paid to do. That's They're not going to bring someone up on the stand who's going to work against their, their client. That would be stupid. So every now and again, that happens too. PTSD has formed the basis for criminal defenses and can also be helpful in the context of sentencing mitigation strategies. Courts have recognized testimony about PTSD is scientifically reliable and therefore allowed as expert testimony. So I just mentioned a moment ago, about our client who was in the war, who lost his best friend and came home and fell victim to drug use and alcohol and made some bad decisions. He did a very good job of mitigating, of telling the judge, I'm not blaming my conduct on that, but I want you to know more about my life, what led me here, how I fell down this path and what I'm doing to get back. So if unfortunately she is convicted, you, could con you will continue to see her lawyers use this mitigated argument of PTSD all the way through sentencing. We'll see how persuasive uh, they are. Uh, an equally critical question is whether Holmes is going to, to, to testify. Um, and here we write the question may be moot since her lawyers already suggest that she will. I've heard that before, then sometimes last minute they don't. It's very easy to see. They'll assess how well the trial is going, um, the posturing of the, of the jury, if they're winning, so sometimes if they're losing big, they may throw out a Hail Mary and say, you got to get on there, get on the stand to be convincing. For any criminal defendant, testifying is not an easy decision. It is a cornerstone of our criminal justice system that a defendant is protected by the Fifth Amendment. You do not. She does not have to take the stand. If she does, uh, prosecutors will use her past statements, of course, to discredit her. For example, when questioned under oath, when questioned under oath, I'm going to go to this blog now, forgive me. Um, when questioned under oath about many of the events surrounding Theranos' alleged fraud during an SEC investigation, Holmes responded 600 times stating, I don't know. That alone could prove very damaging in front of the jury. As the leading face of this company, Holmes is on the record with many public statements that prosecutors can use to determine her credibility. You can expect them to do that. 
Uh, Holmes' legal team recently indicated Holmes would, would tell the story of Balwani's manipulation and abuse to such a degree that she did not have the state of mind needed to form criminal intent to commit fraud. The confident and charismatic CEO everyone saw on TV, they're going to claim, was simply a facade. Balwani dominated her, a much longer, younger, less experienced woman. Blaming Mal Balwani is not without risk. To blame him, Holmes would have to admit her wrongful conduct. Also, jurors may have a hard time accepting Holmes as clueless and naive while at the same time hearing that she was a self-made, powerful billionaire CEO. Now, transitioning to the second argument they're going to make about aggressive marketing and um, whatnot. And as we wrote in this blog, you can get access to a prison professors. In Silicon Valley, a mar aggressive marketing is not fraud. Holmes' legal team previewed another uh, overarching defense to the fraud charges. Everybody markets aggressively in Silicon Valley. This is not fraud, it's the norm, it's the way business is done. All tech startups exaggerate their technology to raise money, they will claim. Marketing puffery and aggressive salesmanship is not a fraud. Experienced investors know this and could not have been duped. I see in this blog, here, we're missing the word not, make a little typo here, but I think we get the gist of it, we know what we're talking about. Now, the third defense here, her lawyers will claim that the missing data will exonerate, exonerate Holmes. To what extent did Theranos produce inaccurate lab results for patients? Reports show that Theranos had to withdraw or overcorrect 1 million test results. Prosecutors plan to introduce this evidence at trial and testimony from about a dozen patients who received incorrect lab results. For example, one patient's results falsely indicated that she had AIDS. Another Patient's lab results show that he was she was having a miscarriage. Miscarriage. She was fine and carried her baby to term. These aren't little oops or little hiccups. Hearing that you have a potentially life-ending disease. I mean, these are really big deals here. Big, big mistakes. On the other hand, Holmes' legal team argues that the judge should exclude patient testimony about inaccurate lab results from the trial. The patient's testimony is anecdotal and could be prejudicial. All laboratories produced some errors. The government cherry picked a few unlucky patients to create the impression that a large portion of Theronis' testing data was faulty. Okay, as we continue to draw firm conclusions about Theranos' testing data on the overall accuracy of Theranos, lab results and draw, draw firm conclusions would require analysis of Theranos' testing data. To consider the lab results data fairly, the jury should have access to the complete picture, including what caused any incorrect results. So you can see that the approach they're going to take probably make it, you know, confusing, get such into the minutia or the details. And they'll say, based on what we've presented without, you know, the government has not proven without a shadow of a doubt. We'll, we'll see. But they've clearly laid out their three approach strategies, their three top defenses. They're going to hit all of them equally hard. And all it takes is one juror to, to be a buyer. Conclusion, most defense strategies are long shots, unfortunately, for the defendant. Statistically, the odds are overwhelming in the government's favor because more than 90% of federal criminal cases result in guilty pleas, and about only one person wins an acquittal out of every 100 cases. That's a very low number. When it comes to wire fraud, the government wins the vast majority of the time. In 2019, for example, 597 de defendants pleaded guilty to wire fraud out of 645. 28 lost to trial. Only two of those wire fraud defendants who took their case to trial and won. Not great odds. Whether or not Holmes' defense serves to acquit her or not on the merits, PTSD, and all this other good stuff, we'll be time, it'll, we're, we're going to know here soon enough. And then we're going to see with Balwani. What I do know is regardless of what happens, she should begin to, to mitigate. Prepare for the worst case scenario. Work under the idea based on the data that she's going to lose and prepare for an inevitable sentencing here. And if she prevails, good for her. She has the courage to, to take it to trial, which the odds are so far against her. But uh, our team at Prison Professors takes it from the perspective of you got to prepare for the worst case scenario. And that scenario includes a likelihood that you're going to get convicted and face a sentencing hearing in front of a very cynical judge who will view you as unrepentant, as someone who created victims, who misled who lied and was unwilling to accept responsibility that the more quickly any defendant, including Ms. Holmes, can begin to embrace these facts, the more she can begin to mitigate and create a plan for that sentencing hearing and begin to work her way back to today, September 20th, 2021. Thank you so much for watching this video. We're going to be filming more videos about the Holmes uh, trial, the strategies, and of course, work our way all the way through the jury's verdict and the consequences that follow an acquittal or a conviction in which you can face up to sentencing. Thank you so much for watching or listening if you're listening to this podcast in your car. Goodbye.